welcome everybody coming in. I'll give a bit of time for people coming in. A few people haven't got the link. Um, for those that don't know where they are, this is the Education Comms Network meeting. Um, we're a group, group of education comms professionals, marketing comms leads. Um, the group started in autumn 2020. Um, the aims of the group are to develop a supportive network um, of comms leads, particularly focused on the education sector. Um, we wanted a network that was just for us where we could share our experiences around our campaigns, what worked for us, what doesn't work for us. Um, we wanted to do our own CPD. Um, we wanted to learn from each other and we wanted to speak candidly um, with other professionals about um, the challenges that we were facing. So we're, if you're new today, welcome. Thank you for joining us. The slot, the, the way it runs, it's, it's an hour, quite snappy. We have two speaker slots and then one is from someone within our network and then an external speaker or an expert. Um, there's plenty of time for questions and we like to run topics that the network are interested in. So if you have any ideas um, or, or there's something that you really want us to cover, let us know. Um, I'm Susan Higgins. I'm head of comms at the Edge Foundation. I wanted to introduce you to Anna Pedroza, who's got a yellow top on today, um, and Dexter Hutchins, who works with me at the Edge Foundation. We are the trio that kind of pull this together. Um, Dexter will add, um, add things to the chat, like email addresses and, and links and things like that. Um, so if you're new to the group and you would like to join and, and be invited to these regularly, then send Dexter an email saying, um, sign me up. Dexter will put his email address in the chat. Um, so just a bit of housekeeping. We're recording this session. Um, if you could keep your cameras on as much as possible, it's just a bit nicer to be speaking to real people and, and see who's there. Um, the, we formed, as I was just saying, we formed in, in autumn last year and we're now about 40 members strong. Um, our members include people from organisations like colleges, universities, membership bodies, uh, think tanks, um, as well as individuals um, that are working independently. Welcome everybody. Um, please add your questions to the chat. Um, keep yourself on mute unless you have a question, then raise your hand or pop your question in the chat. Anna's gonna look out for any questions. Uh, use speak of you so that you can focus on the people that are speaking. Um, and as I said, we're recording this session. So for today, um, we're looking at how marketing and comms professionals can make a positive difference to equality, diversity and inclusion by taking a more proactive approach to all aspects of marketing and comms. Um, a great deal of our work is outward facing, so there's a lot of potential to make a positive impact and difference in this space. Um, however, I know from personal experience at times it can be hard to know where best to start. Um, we hope that this session is going to give you some useful advice. Um, and today we've got two great speakers. The first one is from the beyond outside of the Education Comms Network. And the second is from within it. Um, please add your questions to the chat. Um, and I know that sometimes when you're talking about um, equality, diversity and inclusion, conversations can get quite tense. Um, but for this, this meeting, we're all on a journey. We're all here to learn. Um, and so I'm hoping that we are going to be able to share and, and learn together. 
So kicking off our first speaker is Penny. She's a founding member of the BAME Ed organization, a volunteer run grassroots network aimed at ensuring diverse communities are represented as a substantive part of the education workforce. Penny is a former teacher and she's worked in a number of education organizations around research, uh, membership and development, including the key Challenge Partners and Lifter. She's a long-standing, uh, long-serving governor, school governor, and a MAP trustee, and she's passionate about issues around social mobility, education, and equality of opportunity. Penny, welcome. The floor is yours. Thanks so much. Um, I'm going to share my screen and give you something to look at while I waffle on. So. Um, so I thought it would be useful to talk from my perspective as somebody who kind of straddles quite a few different worlds and some of those are quite similar to the worlds that you're occupying. So um, as was described uh, in the intro, the very kind intro, um, I've, I was a teacher for over 10 years and since 2007 I've worked in a range of organisations that support teachers, school leadership, school governance and some of that work sits quite firmly in the, in the kind of membership, marketing, sales, comms, PR side of things. So I feel like I have um, an understanding of some of the things that you're juggling and uh, working with. Um, and I've also been able to kind of gain this view, not only on the education sector, but also on the kind of charity, social enterprise and startup sectors um, and sort of how schools interface and interact with those. Um, and then, as was mentioned, I'm a uh, school governor, at a primary school, maintained primary school. And just to mix it up a bit, I also am a multi academy trust trustee. Um, and I've been doing both of those roles for quite a while because I really wanted to see what does it look like in the maintained sector and what does it look like in the academy sector. Um, I'm a coach on the Leeds Beckett anti racist schools program. Um, and that has me talking to schools um, about their journey to becoming anti racist organized organizations and I'm a member of my local authorities um, Black Caribbean and BAME achievement group um, and of course I'm a co-founder and trustee of the BAME ed network and I'm a parent of two teenage girls so I get their perspectives of life at school <laughs> on the front lines which is also valuable. So I thought what might be useful for you is just to share some of the trends that I'm seeing over time from this quite interesting viewpoint. Well, I'm finding it interesting. Um, and I think some of the things that I'm seeing are as described here. So first of all, from the Leeds Beckett Anti-Racist Schools Programme um, and from the steady stream of emails that we get at the BAMED network, and I'll talk a little bit more about that network in a minute, it's really clear that schools are trying to tackle, some schools are trying to tackle issues of structural racism, um, but the people who are tasked with doing that in schools, they're either a very junior colleague or a junior colleague who's black or Asian and who's been tasked with leading on it, or um, a senior colleague who is white because white people generally have the more senior positions in school and therefore they'll be asked to lead on an initiative like this. Um, and Either way, it's quite tricky because a white person leading on it uh, can't do that on their own. And, you know, a black or Asian colleague um, will have more of the lived experience, but less of the kind of, generally speaking, if they're not in senior leadership, they'll have less of the kind of power and influence um, to get people to do the things that they need to do and to change the things they need to change. The second thing that's really clear is that racial literacy is poor and, you know, I think all of us in this room today can say probably our racial literacy is poor. I feel like I'm a couple of steps ahead of some of the people that I'm coaching because I need to be, but as people, white 
people who are racialized as white, um, you know, anyone in this room who is racialized as white and brought up in this country will have grown up in a system um, which is inherently and structurally racist. And so we need to learn and unlearn and kind of shift our focus. And also teachers, um, there's been a shift from initial teacher education to initial teacher training. So it's become less about educating teachers for the multicultural classroom or for uh, educating teachers to teach children to occupy a multicultural world. And it's more around the technical aspects of teaching. So behavior management, cognitive processes, getting children to remember things, passing tests and so on. So there's a lot less of a focus on the structure of society and how that works. Um, and that really feeds into our own racial literacy as people you know, who've been educated and are educating in this country. Um, and then we can't also assume that people of color will come with this knowledge either just by virtue of them potentially feeling the effects of structural racism either individually you know or you know professionally personally and and i always kind of explain that by saying i'm a woman but it doesn't mean that i come with a toolkit to dismantle structural sexism by virtue of being a woman i've been educated and socialized into a structurally sexist society so i'm going to need to do some work to make sure that that doesn't filter into my work place and into my relationships and into whatever i'm doing so people leading on edi um, equality, diversity and inclusion or anti-racism in schools, they need to have power, time and a budget to be able to do the work effectively. And I would say the same probably applies to your own workplaces. You need to be able to have some power, time and a budget to make some difference in the way that you're doing things. Um, and definitely for schools, it's a full time role needs you to delegate, monitor, audit, make decisions around strategy and around spending, and you need time to ensure you're informed and literate about race and about racisms. Um, and I think, you know, all schools, unions, education organisations, they're all concerned about recruitment, retention and development of staff in general, but in particular around attracting, retaining and developing staff from Black and Asian heritage. And this can often be purely for optics. So without a real sort of deeper understanding of the barriers that we'll be putting up in our own organizations. Um, so it's really important to think about how, it, wherever you work, how do you shake up that recruitment and professional gen uh, development in general to make you know, great strides towards something that's more equitable. Um, and schools and other organizations that come to the Bay Made Network, they come a lot for support promoting vacancies. Um, but again, their own understanding of the issues is poor. And then the final thing I'll say on, on the kind of like, what are the trends is that the environment is hostile. You probably noticed some sort of grumblings and mumblings from government about, uh, you know, there is no structural racism, um, that it's, they've kind of boiled it down to being problems with individuals and individual families and the way that they treat education. Um, the Equalities Minister herself, Kemi Badenoch, has directly named Black Lives Matter, anti-racism, critical race theory as kind of enemies of progress. Um, and it kind of exposes her own poor racial literacy um, and some really dangerous scare tactics directly aimed at teachers and schools. And then the Sewell report, which came out recently, um, is a real, it's a blow to progress. So to declare that there's no evidence of structural racism, to centre racism on individuals um, and race disparity on a kind of deficit narrative centering on children and their families. It's a, it's a retrograde move that goes against all that we already know. So the BayMed network. Um, I don't expect you to read all the words, but I thought it would be useful. We um, set up in 2017 um, as a kind of collaborative um, and we became a charity this year. Um, and our charitable aims are basically promoting activities that empower 
BAME educators and partnering with quite a lot of different organisations um, to support them to make change. Uh, and those range from individual teachers, schools, uh, unions, you know, some of the organisations like Ambition Institute or Teach First or Multi Academy Trust and so on. So we'll work with anyone who's interested in doing something different and sort of trying to to make change and we're really clear about the fact that we're intersectional in our approach so part of that is that we expect that white people and people of color will work hand in hand to do this work and our trustees and steering group makeup reflects that um, so what we actually do um, and how we might be useful to edge communications network so we have um resources we've got a website and i would urge you to check it out but we basically we try to find practical responses to issues partly because we're a group of six people who all have full-time jobs doing other things and we do this voluntarily um so we for example we will on our website we've got a huge repository of articles books podcasts webinars um, you can search our resources section on keywords and if it doesn't exist we create it so we created a COVID-19 risk assessment and guidance for teachers going back after the first lockdown because there wasn't anything uh, um, and we've um, created for example this might be useful for you a toolkit for organizing an event so making sure that you don't fall into the trap of oh we asked a couple of people of color and then they dropped out and so everybody's white on our panel or all our speakers are white or we don't know people so we don't know who to ask the other thing that we created as a practical response to that issue is our speakers list so um, it's a growing list of uh, people who can speak professionally and with authority and experience around issues um, uh, across the education sector and they happen to be people of colour. Um, we also have an EDI directory. Um, people ask us a lot, can you do this work or that work? We can't really do the work for people, but we can signpost to people who are really good and who can help. So. Um, yeah, and I spend a lot of my time kind of talking to people who are starting to run events and things and they want a little bit of support working through that toolkit and making sure they get it right. We run our own events and conferences. Um, we ran a series called Courageous Conversations About Race. We run, um, we've run just now a careers conference with um, RSA academics um, and all in education. Um, and we have... I think somebody's unmuted themselves potentially. I don't know if anyone's got the controls to mute other people, but I would recommend doing that. Um, we've got hubs also, regional hubs that cover 12 regional areas and three special interest groups. So governance, early years and ethics. Also have a coaching and mentoring program uh, and network. And the other thing that we do that might be of use to you is we have a monthly newsletter that's packed with job ads, opportunities, events, research, news, learning and many more things. And we really welcome if anybody wants us to advertise anything for you or to let people know about things or to ask questions or if you want to do a survey, um, we're really happy to put that in there. Um, and I think I'm probably coming up to the end of my 20 minutes. So I would urge you to just check out the website, follow us on Twitter, and you can follow also each of the regional groups and pop us an email. And I had one thing also that I wanted to say is that we we have an ask as well. We, because we're volunteers and we're kind of doing what we can, um, we would love anyone who has a couple of spare hours that wanted to commit and work perhaps behind the scenes, just helping us with some of the marketing and common stuff that we do. So that might be curating our website. It's a WordPress um, website and we've got a backlog of things that we need to upload onto there. Anyone who wanted to get involved with the social media or things, if you wanted to give of your time as your donation, to progressing Black, Asian and minority ethnic educators, um, we would really be grateful. Thank you.
Thank you, Penny. Um, so my first question is for any of my colleagues on this um, meeting, how can they find you? How can they get hold of you if they've got any questions? Yep, so um, you can follow the Baymed Network on Twitter and it's at Baymed Network. If I just share my screen again, I've actually got a slide with all the various words. Um, you can go to our website and there's a contact page there and do have a look around. You might get lost for several hours, fascinated by what you find there, hopefully. Um, and then you can pop us an email as well, bameed at outlook.com. Great. Um, so I guess I've got a first question to kick us off and please do add your questions to the chat and we'll come to you um, and Anna will keep an eye out for them. Um, it's kind of a broad question, but how can we be more proactive in um, getting uh, diversity on our panels and blogs in a, a, a system, education system that is majority white? It's particularly around, my question is particularly around academics. So this is, I'm working on a research conference right now, and I'm finding that we've... Um, opened up, um, we've, we've done a call for papers internationally, um, but the papers that have come in are majority white, written by white academics. And I know that there are obviously more white academics um, in education, but how can we be more proactive in giving opportunities to people that may not necessarily put themselves forward? Yeah, I think, well, that's part of the reason why we wanted to put together this speakers list. But also, I think there is a problem in that we do, we're a little bit lazy. So we ask people to put themselves forward. And I'm not saying this, you know, I don't want to be disrespectful to any anyone, but it is quite quick and easy to put something out on social media or wherever and say, put yourselves forward. And I guess it's about the understanding about how racism works and how structural racism works is that as a white man I will feel very comfortable volunteering myself for something um, so it is you know it's going to be harder a there'll be fewer people of color who occupy the space that you're trying to bring them into and b they may not have that great sense of entitlement that um, you know that I or you might have we, we you know we might not be even aware of it but we'd be like oh yeah I'll give that a go so I think some of the ways to do it is it's you have to do it over time it's about collecting people I'm a real people collector I have a kind of modern day equivalent of a Rolodex of useful people I have a little folder in my every email account that I have called useful people and I even keep spreadsheets of useful people um, and just catalog them like with yeah maybe I need to seek some help on this but no but um, I like that's what that's how I kind of find people again because there's nothing worse also going oh there was that person and I can't remember how did I so I would say every time you spot somebody who looks interesting and um, you know who is a person of color um, pop them down on your on your hit list um, you could even work together as a group to start curating a list of highly experienced you know interesting good speakers and start creating your own list that would be amazing and if you could make that public for other people um, that's all we've done with our speakers list is we've sought people out we've asked people to put themselves forward and to kind of prove what they've done and make sure that they're viable and I know there's a question here that says how how do you, you vet them um, um, yeah so I think it is about going and hunting um, and if I also blog about things and I've got um, a post that's called if you something around if you want to make a change you've got to go hunting so I think it is about really sort of spending a whole day googling around looking on LinkedIn just really hunting people down and then having conversations with them and saying do you feel that you would like to do this oftentimes you might ask somebody and they'd be like oh I'm not sure I haven't done it before and you might even be able to support them and coach them and work through with them but most of the time people are really competent and confident and they're just hidden 
from our sites because we go with the people we know. Anna, um, are there any questions from the audience? Uh, yeah, Jess, do you want to just ask your question? It's an interesting point. Yeah, thank you. Uh, it's a little bit similar to Susan's in some way. Um, hi, Penny. Um, hi. Yeah, re really interesting discussion. I, I, I work um, with um, quite a few universities and um, I recently came across a really interesting academic who, who is white, um, but wanted to talk about race issues within the context of his research, which <laughs> I don't want to go into too much specifics, but it was about history of art. Um, but we had this conversation, he was telling me how he felt very nervous being a white man talking about race issues. He had some very interesting um, views, um, but he felt that he couldn't, you know, he couldn't speak about it because, uh, because he was a white man. Um, and it, in the end, um, he decided not to. I just wonder, so I know, it, you know, works in you know many ways this but is there any sort of advice for people who um are thinking about you know they've got something to say about race race issues um within the context of their research but a you know are very cautious and worried about how it might come across as a white person um yeah i mean i i am white and i talk quite a bit about race and it is correct to be um respectful and to know your you know stay in your lane um i think i don't think there's a catch-all answer for it i think mm -hmm. it is about understanding the issues and i think if that person is nervous that's good they should be trying to understand why it makes them nervous um but i don't i do strongly believe that white people talking about race um, is it can be really, really useful and important because, um, you know, we kind of made this mess, so we need to be involved in dismantling it, you know. Mm. Um, I, I don't know, in, in that situation, I would say, you know, do they have a colleague who they could team up with who's a person of colour and they could do something interesting together and actually have that conversation right at the beginning, like, who am I to talk about race? Mm -hmm. um, because I think also the other thing I wanted to just say quickly to caution against is when you have people of colour only talking about issues around race, that's really not on if that's what they want to talk about that's fantastic but be be very careful that you know you're inviting people of color to talk about topics that they are expert in and it doesn't necessarily be need to be an expertise around you know racial prejudice um so i hope that's partially answered your question thank you um we've also got a question from evelyn do you want to just raise your point evelyn well, thank you. Um, so I was, I thought that it was really interesting to start with the trends and, and I was, I think, it, yeah, it was really useful to, to sort of contextualize the whole conversation with that, particularly around sort of general hostility in the environment. But, um, and it might be that this isn't what, what you've looked at, but I was just curious about the level, low levels of racial, racial literacy and whether or not there were any other, any differences across uh, the education space in terms of phases, or locations. I imagine geography has, um, uh, or sort of urbanised and more rural areas. There's there's big differences, but I was just curious if there were any across primary schools, secondary schools, AP, um, and if that's something you've look, looked at. Um, I think, in terms of the staff members, you mean their, yeah, their it's, literacy? Yeah. I, yeah. I think well, there's some really interesting writing around the fact that. Um, Obviously, if you if you're in a more multicultural area, you may have a little bit more knowledge about people from a range of different heritages and backgrounds, cultures and religions. However, there's really interesting writing about this move to kind of see multiculturalism 
as a sign that there is no racism is actually quite wrong in that we all kind of rub along together quite nicely or do we is there still racism happening and then on the flip side what I have seen quite a bit is um, teachers in schools and leaders in schools that are predominantly or completely white they say we don't have a problem with racism because we don't have anyone who <laughs> who is black or Asian or you know from a minoritized group and so there's a kind of misunderstanding around what that means and that you actually have to have people that kind of somehow trigger this racism by their very brownness or blackness of skin to kind of make people suddenly reveal themselves as racist. So I think there's there's quite a lot of confusion generally and, and that does come down to our own education and how we've been taught to not see things and not respond to things. Um, so yeah, and I think also the other thing to mention is that there's some really interesting work going on. Um, there's a group called uh, the Early Years Blacklist, and they're doing incredible work around um, anti-racism in early years because we have a kind of view that, oh, children, very young children don't see colour and they don't experience racism or they aren't racist, but there's quite a lot of research that says no it re starts really young that we start to see see what we perceive as difference and start putting ourselves with our in group and avoiding the out group and mm -hmm. so they do some brilliant work around how to how to tackle that in early years Penny that's really thank helpful thank you thank you so much for coming to talk to us that's Penny Rabiger 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 <laughs> Rabiger <laughs> Um, and thank, thanks, if, if anyone wants to get in touch with you afterwards, um, that you've given them your details. Um, we're going to move on with the time, really, um, because now we've got quite a lot of questions, uh, to Tamsin Caffrey. So Tamsin's from the network. Um, she's been head of communications at Engineering UK since 2014, um, and they promote programmes and products for schools um, they deliver corporate comms to engage the engineering community and manage national campaigns like tomorrow's Engineers Week, um, which encompasses both education and industry audiences. Townsend's work is always linked to education and skills, having previously worked for Creative Skillset and the National Centre for Languages and managing multidisciplinary teams to support educational aspiration and career development. Tamsin, welcome. Thanks for joining us. The floor is yours. Thank you. Um, hello, everybody. You've probably never heard of Engineering UK, and that's fine. Um, our mission is to encourage more and more diverse young people into engineering careers. And that more diverse aspect is a really important addition that has been made in recent years. Um, and as was mentioned in the intro, we run our own engagement programs. So working with schools to showcase to young people who are studying science and maths, what that could mean in real life. And we work with engineering employers who are doing their own outreach work um, in schools to make that outreach um, better in terms of quality and inclusivity. And over the past few years, our focus has really shifted from volume, we need every school in the country to do one of our things, to quality. Let's make sure that we're hitting the schools that need it most and where we're gonna have the most impact. And we really organizationally challenge ourselves and the industry to look beyond gender uh, when we talk about improving diversity. For so long in engineering, diversity has basically meant equals gender because there were hardly any women. And we're trying to really change that and show that it's much, a much broader conversation that we need to have to, to get away from the profile of white, middle-class, middle-aged men um, being engineers. Uh, personally, my passion point is around social mobility and raising aspiration, really. So I was the first person in my family to go to university. 
um, weirdly for a, um, a kid from a North London um, council estate. I studied French at university and I went and I traveled abroad. So I have had my horizons opened by education and that is really dear to me. So for me and my colleagues will attest to this, I'm always about the kids, whatever the project is that I'm doing. And I want every child that comes into contact with any of our work, whether that's an event, a, a case study, a, a piece of paper or an activity, to see someone that they can relate to in some way. That could be ethnicity, gender, disability. For us, it's also whether it, they've come through a vocational route or an academic um, route, you know, and whether or not they're a high flyer, this isn't just for the kids who are top of the class. And really for me, I'm totally sold into the, you know, you can't be it if you can't see it. And that's such an important driver behind the work that I do personally. But I'm also really lucky because where I work, we have an organizational EDI strategy. So this isn't a comm strategy, this is an organizational piece. And we have brought in expertise in-house, having done loads of training. We now have somebody whose job it is to help deliver against that strategy. But we also use um, membership of external networks like ENEI, um, to support our work so in terms of the delivery that we do but it's also really helpful in terms of us being more inclusive as an organization whether that's you know in recruitment um, or delivery and for example we've got a new um, inclusive recruitment policy that's getting rolled out that amongst other things says if you don't have a representative panel go outside of the organization and find somebody to support you so we are on a journey. We're definitely not there yet, but we are on a journey. Um, and prior to the strategy, we always gathered data on schools and where we could, the young people that were in our programs. It covered gender and we used free school meals, polar data to get a sense of kind of social background. But we've expanded those criteria. So they're now much broader. So we cover ethnicity, um, special educational needs and disability, free school meals and rural location. And we have set criteria for each of the four nations of the UK because we, ask, we benchmark them against the national average. And obviously the national average in Wales will be very different to the national average in England in terms of ethnicity, for example. So for us, we have what we call our EDI criteria, which means we have our EDI schools. And basically, if you are a school that is equal or above national average for free school meals and the proportion of minority ethnic groups in students, you're an EDI school. But then also we have another set of criteria around special educational, needs and rural that means if you just meet one of them so if you're a special school you're in you're in, you're an EDI school so we apply these criteria so that we have program level KPIs for EDI uh, on everything that we do and we do a lots of different things and we have a target of a 50 50 gender split on every student facing program that we do. So the measuring of the EDI, thankfully I didn't have to do this piece of work because this is not for me, but somebody, brilliant, basically mapped all of the schools in the UK against our EDI criteria. And that allows us to have this kind of central master list that we can then refer back to. So we are able to measure our work against specifically against that list of schools but we really also had to look at the offer I, don't, I think it just it doesn't matter how good your comms are if what you're offering in what you're offering there are barriers to participation for different groups and then, then you're never going to succeed and have the impact that you need to have so we work for example to have fully accessible events so an online event would have sign language interpretation. We'd always have that available at face-to-face. -face. We have quiet spaces. We have, you know, disabled access. 
we tried to make all of our assets and our content as diverse and inclusive as possible and this comes back to the kind of you have to see it to be it that's images that's case studies it's messaging it's subtitles it's assumptions just kind of you know we're not just talking to middle class kids for example um, and it's pitched for all abilities it's not just you know as, as I said earlier the A star students but we've also started offering bursaries to schools which we have to fundraise for and we make them really easy to access <laughs> we know who's eligible so we target those schools and they can spend it on whatever they want within reason to be able to participate in those programs and where they are funded by a specific employer we're also in some cases able to offer some mentoring so we have a competition where kids do project work and they have engineers that help them and um, give them advice on their on their projects we really we <laughs> i think we just know that we don't know it all and we're on a journey and i think that's a really important starting point but you have to just take the next step and take the learnings and take the next step and we've over the past year or so established a network of teachers and we consult with them basically when we're making big decisions on the work that we're doing on our activities so that what we develop is relevant and useful for those EDI schools as we as in our shorthand and that network we've got about 12 teachers um 75 percent ish um are from our EDI schools and we had to go outside of our normal network so this isn't our subscriber list already converted we went outside of that academy trust state school networks like future first we went to baymed pretty sure we got something in one of your newsletters um, networks of send teachers to recruit those teachers and we offered a little incentive a thank you um, but they're not obliged to come to every session and in fact they don't um, and it is those teachers from the EDI schools that are the hardest to, to secure and to keep them coming back. But generally, we have about 50% of the teachers that are in those meetings are from those schools. And they have an opportunity to share. We have an opportunity to ask specific questions. But then we always talk to them about how we can reach the schools and the students within those schools with um, programs and messaging and how do we make the most impact for these diverse young people because ultimately we go through the schools and the teachers but it's all about the kids um and so it's through that teacher network and through we do a lot of program evaluation just keep asking teacher stuff all the time even if you don't want to know the answer it's going to help you uh, in the long run and to understand what their barriers are and to adjust the messaging. And I think that's so important because we think we've got the perfect message because it makes so much sense to us. And we've just, we've got a turn of phrase that is brilliant. Um, and then they come back to us and they said, oh, when you said this, we thought it was this. And we're like, ah, oh, okay. And that's, we have to allow them to challenge our assumptions about how our messaging is landed. And organizationally, we have a language guide which is produced by our head of EDI, which kind of advises on the current best terminology. And that I think as a comms team, as much as an organization gives us the confidence to talk about this and to the schools that we really want to target. And we're quite upfront with those EDI schools where we're targeting them specifically because they're in a rural location or they have, they meet X criteria that that is why we're we're talking to them at that given point um, i'm sure that many of you work with mailing houses like sprint schools marketing company education um, company and we spoke to quite a few <laughs> different mailing houses because what we wanted to do was to get them to map against our schools and our criteria and they can all do free school meals, as you would expect. They can all do um, special schools. Some can do rural, some can do ethnicity or it's coming or they're planning it. And we asked them a lot of questions. And in the end, where we settled was, if we give you our list of schools, will you send out a targeted campaign to everybody for whom you have a name contact? Um, 
And they said yes, and they could do it. And so where we're specifically targeting EDI schools, which is a lot of our work now, we give them the school name, the URN and the postcode, and where they have those name contacts, that's who gets the, the mailer. And I'll just give you a, a really recent example. So recent, that I don't have the evaluation. Um, but last week we had a three day virtual event called Big Bang Digital. So if you think of it as like a three day live broadcast for schools that they can dip in and out of, there's live Q and A, there's panels, workshops, some pre-recorded on demand content and an award ceremony. It was quite full on, anyway. So we've got our own audience, subscriber list, social media, and we did all of our usual comms out to them. But what we also did working with the mailing houses was to send a targeted email campaign to that list that where we know that we uh, the schools that we want to engage and where they engage in any way, if there was a click through, if there was an open uh, a reply, anything, we followed it up with a traditional snail mail poster um, into their uh, pigeonhole, if that still exists in the, in the same way. We know teachers love posters, right? So we were just like, you're going to get it whether you like it or not. Um, and we've also looked at, we, because we had live British Sign Language interpretation across the three days, we're like, well, we want deaf kids to be able to really access this if it's, it's there and available to them. So we worked with specialist um, networks supporting schools with deaf children so that they could then amplify our comms for us. So they, we spoke to them, they put it in their newsletters, they sent out our flyers, they spoke to their networks about it. And the same for Facebook, we did a targeted ads campaign to special educational needs teachers. Um, so we spent about 500 pounds, got around 2000 clicks, which I think for special educational needs teachers feels like a reasonable return. Um, but again, we're still doing the full evaluation on that. But our KPI for this event was that 55% of schools that registered um, were on our EDI list. And we didn't meet that target. Um, we got 51%. We had 125,000 kids um, registered for that event. So if 50% of them um, are in those schools, we think that we're, we're, we must be doing something right. And that is a really um, helpful step for us as our, you know, before we do the full evaluation to just have that clicking over all the time to know we're at 20%, we're at 30%, we're at 40%. And we are at school level at the moment. So it's just the schools that meet the criteria. We know that there are schools that don't meet the criteria that have children and young people that would meet our criteria. And we're, we're working on a strategy to be able to, to do that next. Um, with, as I say, it's a journey. Um, there's so much that I could say about this and I would happily, even though when Anna first asked me, I was like, oh, I don't know if I've got anything to say, can't stop talking. But I think the real takeaways for me are, if you've got your strategy organization wide rather than just a comm strategy, that's the best starting point because you're going to have buy-in, you're going to have support and you've got an offer. You need to know where you are now and where you want to be. And you've got to do that data analysis or if you're lucky, get someone else to do it for you um, and work with those specialist networks. They'll give you access to their networks. That's brilliant. But what they also give you is rich insight and intel about those the, the people that you, you want to talk to. And that's invaluable, frankly. Um, and don't just go with the standard offer from your mailing houses and marketing agencies. Actually have a conversation with them about what you're trying to achieve and how you, know, you could work together to do it. Because we were really surprised at some of the things that we were able to do, which on the rate card just didn't seem possible. And, as I say, I happily talk for hours and take any questions. Thank you, Townsend. Um, we're a bit short on time. Anna, I'm going to come to you to find out if we've got any questions. 
we had one question from Sarah, Sarah Gadzik, um, which Penny has partially answered, but I don't know if you've got anything to add, Tamsin, which is a question about how to influence colleagues or partner organisations or clients or even mailing houses um, who don't think that there's an issue with EDI or unconscious bias. Yeah, I think for us, it's it come, always comes back to being able to be really upfront with ourselves and try to be honest. And for example, I've just done a piece um, of work on inclusive recruitment and I, th I thought that our team did really well. I think, I think we're great at this. And then she said, so for example, in your team, you're almost all women. So you're always women on the panel and you recruit women. And we went, hmm. Yeah, we should get a man on the panel, for example. We never thought about that. And I think that it's about having somebody who, whose job it is to challenge those things and to point them out and for you organisationally to, to accept that that's really uncomfortable and that some people won't like it, but that's okay. You, ha you have to be able to challenge them, even if they're above you. And then and they're more senior if that's what you're employed to do it's harder if you're not if that's not your role that's a good question thank you Tamsin. it's a good question sarah and i think it picks up on the point you made at the beginning penny with regard to power and the people that in schools you see leading initiatives around anti-racism um and and that sort of slightly polarized groups of either people um of color who, ha who lack power or white men who have lots of power. And I liked your point, Penny, about teaming up and bringing those two people, people together in partnerships. I think that's a good practical solution. Would you have anything to add on that, Penny? I was gonna say also, um, I, I liked what you said, Tamsin, about having somebody who can be that kind of critical friend. And I think what you're trying to do as an organization is have that critical friend, but also not just rely on them to, you know keep absorbing and go okay now I think I can see that next time next time I walk into a room full of women I can go oh these are all women <laughs> you know because we can't see until it's pointed out and there is quite a bit written now about having this EDI lead as the kind of single point of failure they get blamed if it's not working fast enough or well enough um, so it, it it is about that kind of teaming up, keeping your eyes open, inviting critique. Don't wait and then go, oh, I'm mortified I got it wrong, but go, hey, what's wrong with this picture? You know, what am I doing wrong? So, yeah, just being alert and um, active about it. I think that's absolutely right. And I'm, I'm really pleased, actually, to say that at Engineering UK now, it's taken a while, but now we're like, I don't know if I'm doing this right. I'm going to just check in with with somebody and they'll come back and they say you could tweak this or you could do something different or yeah don't worry about it go um, and I think that that is a really it's so great to have that support but we organizationally spread that responsibility they probably don't feel that but we feel that we spread that responsibility quite quite well at least at the moment thank you both um, it's it's a, a topic that I would like to come back to. I feel like there is so much for us to learn. We're all at different stages in this process. So I'd really be interested in other people sharing their experiences and potentially putting together this joint list of speakers, um, because I think that would be really useful to all of us. But it would be a, it would be great for us to have something that we kind of co-create as a group. Um, so thank you both of our speakers. Um, just to whip through a few bits of news. Um, so from the Edge Foundation, we've got a couple of events coming up. Tomorrow is the research conference. Uh, so it's an education focused research conference. We're in partnership with education and employers. Um, there are still tickets available. You can find out about it on our website. Um, we also have an event next week with Kate Green MP, and she will be talking about assessment um, and Labour's views on assessment. Um, we have a guest speakers 
Sarah Fletcher from uh, St Paul's Girls and um, I am, have a bit of a professional crush on Sarah Jane Blakemore. She's um, a neuroscientist and for some reason I've had this obsession with getting brain scans on and what that might show. So her specialism is the teenage brain and she looks at how that affects young people, particularly at exam stage um, and why exams are bad for your health. Um, so that's also next week. So you can find out about both of those. Um, we wanted to ask you to come forward with ideas of topics for us to cover. So please do contact me or Dexter about that. Um, and also we had an idea of um, like an ECN surgery where you could come to us with a problem that you're trying to solve in um, your, in your, as part of your role. And we could do a five minute blast with everybody's ideas of things that they would do, people they would contact. And I just thought, do you know what? That would be a really useful, productive way of making sure that everybody that's part of the call gets something back out of it. Um, and even if you just, off, everyone offered one idea, it would be a whole load of things to take back. So um, let me know if you like that idea and if anyone has something, now it would be confidential. It could, can be anonymous if um, you're nervous about sharing a problem, but I'm sure that we can, yes, I'm getting good feedback on that. Anna, was there anything else? Um, just to add one thing as a sort of follow up from the presentations today, um, I wanted, I just wanted to suggest to colleagues that they might want to reflect on a, a goal or an objective that we might have around EDI, either something that would be particular to our own organisations or something we could share as a group. I mean, we've already talked about a list of speakers and, and, and feeding into that or even passing contacts on to BAMED, which might be useful. But um, um, it's just something maybe we could follow up with in the email, Susan. Yeah, particularly at members. You know, it's something that I've thought about that we need to be proactive in encouraging members from every background um, and in seeking them out, which I feel is this is it's not just about being open, it's about going and finding people. And so I feel like inspired by you both today, we need to go on the hunt. Um, we, I will be at both party conferences, September and October um, for the Edge Foundation. So I just wanted to say, if anyone else is going to be attending either of the conferences, if they happen, um, and you might be interested in doing a pop-up um, ECN meet, glass of wine, coffee meet. Um, I will be sending around details about that. And we thought that maybe education policy would be a good topic for the next meeting. So the we're looking at the 12th of October for the next meet. It seems like ages away, but these things come around really quick. Uh, two o'clock, which is the usual slot, an hour. Um, and we thought we would talk about education policy in connection with comms. Um, so if you would like to contribute or there is anyone that you'd like to put forward, let us know. Um, but otherwise, thank you for joining us and have a great afternoon.